Welcome to the Dabbled In with your hosts, Tori Snyder, Dan Brown, and Danny Castro. All right, guys, you are back in the Dabbled In. Great to have you back. Super excited for this one. I am a comic book. It's in my genes. I'm a comic book fiend. We're excited to talk comic books with you this time. We could not think of anybody better for bringing back our good friend Bill Bowers. He writes comic book reviews. He works for a comic book consignment shop where you can get some amazing deals on Instagram. I don't know anybody better as our comic books than Bill. Welcome back to the Dabble Den, Bill. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to have you back. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, there's. I mean, the co- comics are such a awesome topic. There's so much to say ab- about what's going on in the industry right now, and just our love of it for sure. So, I love you. I, where, where are we going to start? I love your background stuff. That's pretty awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, some just a. It doesn't even begin to capture all the things I love. Uh, but you know, I got some old comics, some new, uh, you know, some art. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I love going. I, I do love going to shows and being able to meet artists and buy art, and uh, I love being able to browse the comics. So, yeah, um, do, doing what we do online, it's nice to be able to offer some of that. Probably be part nice. of our conversation today. So, Bill, what do you do? Who are you associated with? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've been trading comic books for a while, and I've been reading comic books since I was like a really young kid. Uh, But I I work currently for Elite Comics 11 on Instagram. Uh, You can, if you go on sci-fi, you can actually see an article about what we're doing. Uh, So we do comic consignments, uh, which is what we've always done. But ever since kind of COVID-19 and the cons being closed and the shutdowns, you know, a lot of uh, comic stores have had to close. A lot of vendors who rely on going to conventions haven't been able to do that. So we partnered with a lot of these people to do split screen live sales on Instagram and bring their comics to pe- the people that want to be able to buy them. So we're connecting them, and I feel like it's been a huge success. But it's just been an outpouring of love for these vendors and the community, and people have really enjoyed getting together. And it's I got goosebumps just even talking about it. So it's really nice. Comic people are like some of my favorite people, and since we can't get together in person, doing it online, it's been really a great experience. And you know, I'm excited to see what it's grown into and just that it continues. We've we, we continue to have vendors who have been impacted. Like, you know, our window is broken and we haven't been able, you know, there's one that we just did a live sale for. Literally, their front window was broken and they hadn't made enough sales to even be able to repair it. You know, we did a couple live sales with them. Their window's fixed and it's it's really been a good um, a good experience. That's awesome. Yeah, we're Big proponents of the in the din of supporting your local comic book shop, supporting artists. It's a, obviously, you know, Danny's been running the din spotlight on. So, yeah, definitely check out uh, Elite underscore Comics 11 on Instagram. You guys support them and uh, help them support the Remedy Tour. So since we're talking comic collectants, I'll throw it back to you, Bill. Why don't you uh, start us off kind of round robin? When did you start collecting? And how about, like, what's your favorite comic and your favorite artist of all time? Oh. Oh, wow. I mean, favorite comic, favorite artist. It's such a huge question. I mean, when I started, I was probably like seven or eight. My mom would want to go and get her hair done at the beauty shop. And, you know, she we'd pick up a comic down the street before I would sit there and wait for her hair to get done. And uh, classic X-Men Volume 1, Issue 15 was my first comic issue. It reprinted some of the original X-Men comics. My mom wasn't going to go and buy me like a $30 back issue at that time. So, you know, that was just what was on the stands. And, you know, I've been a huge, I've loved X-Men ever since. Uh, and, so, you know, I still have, a, I still have that issue, you know, that uh, my original comic. Um, as far as my favorite comic uh, of all time, I mean, I don't know, X-Men issue number one, it was Jim Lee, it was Chris Claremont. They were at the height of their just amazingness and uh i mean i think it's still to this day the best-selling comic of all time and there's a reason for that it was just such a an experience uh to 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 have gotten that comic and to read it and you know jim lee's art was amazing so i mean i'm just gonna go with jim lee as my favorite artist just because i'm talking about it now i mean you ask me an hour from now maybe i'll say somebody else <laughs> that was just such a time for the x-men and you know people are still i mean the x-men cartoon was big at the time it was just such a great time yeah. that's cool what about you dan so um 
Yeah, as a kid, and even now, I still don't really collect comics. I do love reading comics. So my uncle uh, it was huge into comics, and every time we get the chance to go visit him, that's when really I got to spend a lot of time with him and the family just reading comics and immersing myself in that world. And it's really brought my love of comics in. Uh, and so even now, I'm still trying to, you know, maybe start grabbing some comics off the, off the walls so my kids can start reading comics with me, right, to start passing that love around. Um, I got to say my favorite comic uh, book, because it's going to be plural is the uh the night when stacy died um story arc right um you know and it wasn't one of the first set of comics that i read but i really enjoyed how they really just killed off gwen stacy and really just yeah this, this is what's going to happen and how much it changed not only peter parker but also mary jane and the, the characters that were around that i really enjoyed that um favorite artist i, I Bill here. It's really hard to kind of just pinpoint and say that is my favorite artist. Um, I, I really, really do enjoy uh, a lot of the artistic features that uh, arrive there in comic books. Um, it's, I, can't, I can't really pinpoint anybody on that one. So me, I started collecting when I was young, just kind of like, I think I was, my parents just sent me to go get a, a paper and some like biscuits from Hardee's. And I walked into the, rode my bike and there was a comic book shop and walked in and then they had a, a big, huge shelf that was 25 cent comics. And then I've always been frugal. And so I looked through and what comic did they have the most of in the 25 cent bin? Captain America and the Falcon comic books. So all of this started because there was more 25 cent Captain America comics in the pit <laughs> of that comic book store than anything else. And then that gradually grew from just always been hardcore cap. That grew to almost everything Marvel. There was a time where I had that classic go to the comic book store. I had my own bin that had Snyder on it. And I went on comic book day and I had my stack of comics, you know, that were waiting for me. And I was, you know, there was like eight iterations of Spider-Man and six iterations of X-Men all at once and X-Force and X-Factor and everything. So I was buying a lot of comics, long board after long box after long box. And then gradually... That died out to, I just realized in prep for this, I hadn't bought a new comic or read a comic book since 2013. So shame on me. In prep of this, I went on eBay and I bought every Captain America comic that's come out since 2013 yesterday, last night on eBay. <laughs> Read, bought, read the Rick Remender run. It's oh, so good. Yeah, I, I bought a bunch of complete sets, you know, because there's been volume seven, but, you know, so I'll be caught up in a couple weeks. And then so I'm going to change. So I could say, obviously, my favorite is still Cap and Kirby. You know, you can't be old Kirby Cap comics, but best in the world. But I'm going to change it up a little bit. So favorite comic, I'm going to go with uh, Secret Wars number one. Or the whole Secret War series, because that was original MCU, if you think about it. Because before then, you might get Spider-Man show up here, or, you know, a character show up. The Secret Wars was all of Marvel in one spot. The Beyonders playing games, pitting people versus each other. It was That was like the original MCU Avengers, like everybody together. So that comic book series, plus, you know, all you Venom fans, that's where you got... You know, that's where Venom the Symbiotes came from. And then artists, instead of Cap, I'm going to go with Mark Farling because I also collected during the Image boom. And then when Spawn came out and then he started putting out the McFarlane toys, that was that was just unlike anything I had seen before. So it, excluding Cap, I'm going McFarlane and Secret Wars. <laughs> How about you, Daddy? I will take you back to a nice spring day, and I'm in second grade. My friend is selling me sketches of Wolverine. I have no idea who Wolverine is. Um, but that started my my introduction into comics, uh, because right after that, I'm like, I need to know who this guy is. Went to a local comic book store, and I think it was it was an older X-Men comic that I first picked up. Uh, but then I, I, I stopped, and I came back right when the actual x-men one relaunched everything so that's jim lee so i think jim lee I, that's why i've talked about jim lee in the past i i love jim lee he's the one i, I credit for getting me into comics and i lo loving his stuff um so that, yeah x-men was my thing growing up it didn't it it's i've started getting away from x-men as i grown up um but my favorite comic book 
my favorite comic book was at that time one of my favorite characters. He's he's changed a little bit throughout the years. The Merc with the Mouth, my the first issue, <laughs> New Mutants number ninety eight. Uh, the Vault. You know, I mean, yes, the Deadpool's in there, but really, it's Gideon. Like we want to know the first appearance of Gideon. That's what we, we were looking <laughs> for that in that issue. Um, but I, I liked the New Mutants run. I ended up actually not reading the Newmans until after I was I started reading X Force. So I was a big Liefeld X Force fan early on. Um and then it was I, I don't know, it was cool. It had Juggernaut. I remember Juggernaut was in there quite frequently. Spider Man in the for early epi early episodes, early comic books run in the X Force. So I just loved every the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, uh Black Tom Cassidy. I loved every all the characters in X Force. So I was X Force, X Factor, X Men growing up. That was me. Um, right now, like in terms of what are my favorite artists, I, I would still say Jim Lee. Um, I like a lot of the cover artists that are out there. J. Scott Campbell has some amazingly great covers. Um, uh, Art Germ has some great covers as well. Like, I mean, they're really photorealistic. Like they are, they're masters of their craft. So that's uh, that's who I like. And of course, um, I don't know if you could see pins in the corner, right there, Scott Young. Like I, I like Scotty Young, whether it's Marvel stuff or non-Marvel stuff. Um, one of his comic books just ended. Uh, Middle West, great series, in my opinion. But that's that's where I would go. I gave away my secret. I had like fallen away. I think it was because I lived in Hawaii, didn't have any comic shops close to me. I missed that whole go to the store experience. I never, I didn't seek it out to buy any online. I didn't seek it out to read any of them digitally. So uh, that's still an opportunity to read them digitally. So I still went online and like bought all my old Captain America issues to catch up. But uh, like Bill, our comic expert, like what's the future of comics with uh, digital buying online or reading online? Where where is this going? You know, I don't see either going away. I mean, I think digital has its place and has its convenience, and uh, the the paper comic also. <laughs> Uh, is a very important part of the industry. I mean, look at variant covers are huge right now. You can't, I don't think variant covers and the art would just be the same if it was only digital. I don't think people would be as excited about it. I don't think we'd be selling as many copies of the books. I mean, honestly, I'm not sure how many people are opening some of the books that they're reading, I mean, that they're buying. So I'm glad that, you know, that we have digital for people who want to read, especially if you're on the go. I mean, I, when I was traveling and I was like, man, I want to read some comics. It was nice to just be able to like boot something up and impulse buy some comics and just be reading. Boom, like that. I didn't have to bring them with me. But, you know, when I'm at home or, what, you know, I, I love my paper comics and I love having them around. So I don't think it's an either or. I really see the future being both and be, everybody being kind of simpatico with those both existing. Um, that's that's kind of what I see right now. No, it's fair. Like, I... That's the one thing. I did get caught up, but then I noticed on, geez, half of the comics I got, you know, when I bought, like, Volume 7, 1 through 25, number 1 had 12 different variant covers, I think. Number 25 had a bunch. So, yeah, like, the variant cover thing has gotten huge. But I think it's because there's so many amazing artists out there, and then mm -hmm. they want their take on, you know, on the cap or you know any other you know big name product yeah and i love the different takes we're getting to see on a, a character it's like a new character is created and then you can see you know five or six different artists kind of rendition of that character like with noel in the venom series now yes. or people are really excited about uh, the black winter you know donny cates is a very popular writer right now and uh people are very excited about his creations but uh getting to see different artists do their take on these characters is really kind of fun and you know i have my personal favorites danny has his personal favorites i mean so it's fun that we can all kind of get that chance to have there's there's a comic for everybody as the owner of my local comic shop joe field says uh, he owns Flying Colors Comics. Uh, he says there's a comic for everybody. I just didn't realize that it was not that it was going to be a different comic for everybody. <laughs> you know, but that, that's what's great about the industry right now. There's so such a big variety. Um, I, you know, I echo what you said, like being on the go and like, like Tori. I mean, just I was in Hawaii with Tori, and there's a couple small comic book shops, but I mean, it wasn't something you saw up there unless you were a hardcore comic book fan. Uh, I was able to keep up with some of the stuff uh, because of 
you know, the digital media, uh, being able to just go and say, okay, a new comic came out. Let me one, two, I'm also kind of cheap. So I, I couldn't always just go and, you know, especially paying for older uh, stuff, right? Like if you want to catch up to secret wars or like Tori's doing now, where he's trying to catch up with all the Captain America, it, it, sometimes buying the paper versus the digital is a little bit more expensive depending on where you can find them at. And sometimes you're just like, look, I just want to get back into the story and understand where things are going. Yeah. And it's good. If you, if there's something you really love, it's fun to have the paper version, but if you just want to catch up on some reading, I mean, the catalog gets bitter, bigger every week, new comics come out, you know, it's an infinite bookshelf having digital. So it's nice to have that flexibility, but to have some paper versions of the stuff that I really love and want to be able to have in my hands, you know, right. I'm definitely older. I want to touch it, but then, so I've been out of the game for a while, and then I had this love-hate relationship when I left that, uh, you know, like I said, Secret Wars was amazing to me because that was like bringing everybody in. And when I kind of left collecting, it seemed like, at least for Marvel, it had gone almost exclusively to that because it was a run of... While they were amazing, I loved World War Hulk, I loved Secret Wars, I loved, you know, Civil War, I loved, but it came to be like, as soon as one overarching Marvel storyline stopped, another one immediately picked up, and if you really wanted to know what was going on, you couldn't just read Captain America, you had to buy that comic and, you know, it was across every scale, and while I loved the stories, it was almost overwhelming to me. I think that's one of the reasons I dropped. Is the industry, is it still doing that? Because uh, I'm out of the game, actually. I think that they, I think that there's been some feedback that they've, I, you know, they're, they're, some of the editors have acknowledged that they want to write events where you can just write, read the series, and it's standalone enough. But if you want, like, the expanded experience, you can write everything. I mean, I think there's mixed success with that. But, I mean, I think they've heard that feedback, and some of the events have tried to answer that. But, yeah, they sell more books if you have to read, you know, across ten titles. So, <laughs> Yeah, Tori, right now there's a there's a Marvel event called Empire that's happening right now. And it's it's doing this very similar thing. You know, you have – there's the main story, and then you have their little – the side stories for every single individual. And they do tie in here and there. But uh, to Bill's point, they're trying to keep it as self-contained as possible. But – you're gonna if you want the full picture, you still gotta go get the other ones. And I know it can be a little bit of a turnoff if you, especially if you're if if you're a kid just wanting to get one or two comic books. And you know, who are you catering to? The the kid who wants to go ahead and start reading a good story, or the true collector and one that has a, a large access of funds to be able to collect every single part of the story. And I know growing up, I'm like, I don't know what happened to this part of, of for example, Civil War. Uh, you know, I, I collected all the civil main Civil War stories, that I, and then the one, then the ones that interest me. You know, the the Spider Man part of it, the, but there there's still references that I didn't get, and until this day, I still don't get them. But mm -hmm. it's it it still, it still happens. And then when I grew up, it was you know it was DC and Marvel. I mean, like, and then I think there was one kid that had some Valiant comics that was weird, and then you know. <laughs> If you got some, like, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics were amazing when they first came out. You know, there was very few, like, independent. And then for me, the big one, you know, Image came on board. I've watched the, you know, oh, and that's the San Diego Comic Con. You know, Todd McFarlane had a, a panel about, you know, when Image came aboard. The Image comics, Savage Dragon, Wildcats, they were awesome. Where does it stand now? I know, like, has the big companies, like, gobbled up you know walking dead comes out i know they're like actually owned by somebody now i got bought by somebody who bought something else where does it what's the state of the industry as far as like publishing wise you know i mean it's still the big two i mean marvel's still always been like number one and dc's kind of been close second uh and the gap you know raises the lower between them i think you know dc um has recently switched distributors and i think it's been a little bit of a divisive move maybe over time things will smooth out but comic stores are used to just being able to order from diamond and now they're ordering from a few different places uh images uh industry share seems to kind of raise and low lower between like 14 percent and seven eight percent and 15 you know it, it it varies but you know i think it's really important that there's the, the these creator-owned properties exist and you know they 
if it was just left to Marvel and DC, we'd get a lot of superhero stuff. But a lot of the media that we really love right now on TV are some of this smaller independent label stuff, you know, and uh, I think that it's really good. And I know some writers are writing it sort of like, a, hey, here's a Mark Millar. He'll do these short series and it's sort of like, a, here's my concept. Hollywood buy it, you know, and he got a big deal, I think, from Netflix to to develop. So, you know, it, there's still a place for it. Valiant was huge back, in, and the stories were really good. Valiant got exciting because the stories were really good back in the 90s. And um, then they got bought out by Acclaim and things like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as the industry goes, there's still a, a big variety. And I know that IDW does a lot of really good licensed properties. I'm really excited to read, you know, Power Rangers and Star Trek. And, uh, gosh, I mean, they have the Turtles now. So they're really big with their license stuff. Uh, so, th like I said, there's a huge variety, and I, I, I appreciate that um, that we that we you know that we have just like with television. There's so many different options. I mean, we're kind of like that with comics too. So, yeah, I guess. Oh, I, sorry, I did not mention Dark Horse. I was a Dark Horse fan too. You get some cool, weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got Hellboy, the Dark Horse. Yeah. You got a lot of. A lot of cool Dark Horse stuff, but I still appreciate Image and like what they stood for and just, you know, I think, I, I mean, everybody's probably seen the doc. If you haven't seen documentaries about it or read about it, I mean, the, they were rock stars. I mean, the artists and the writers, I mean, you pick up some old DC comics and Marvel comics, you can hardly tell who the writer and artist is. It's like a little, you know, now it's like everybody knows the names really well. And they're front and center. The signatures are big on the on the art. So, yeah. so what do you think is kept? Obviously, you know, I know you're you're doing comic book consignment selling. You know, buying and selling. Like, what do you think is kept comics like going? You think it's the whole movie and television industry with like so sports cards? You know, just collapsed upon itself. You know, because just started creating so much, and then the whole you know a hundred dollar you know, King Griffey Jr. rookie card. Now everybody and their mother has them in their $10 instead of a hundred. What, how is comics done? And we, you know, what's kept it going? Yeah. I still have my 89 top set that I think everybody has. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think it's different. I think people, you know, are, are, are thinking about the comics kind of boom and bust that happened in the 90s, early 2000s, you know, where they're selling millions of issues of a series. They're de we're not selling millions of comics anymore per issue. And I think people back then, like when the death of Superman, they were buying multiple boxes of just that issue. There's probably still pallets of that issue around somewhere. Same with, you know, early Spawn issues. You know, people were kind of joking when Spawn 1 was like it became a $20 issue because it's like, ah, oh, there's probably a pallet of that sitting somewhere in a warehouse. And there might still be, but people are excited about Spawn. And it's, you know, I'm glad that it, it, people, uh, you know, it, it was such an achievement to hit, you know, 301 issues as an independent uh, comic. Uh, as far as, you know, where the industry is going with that, it's definitely part of it. And I think people, you know, people are excited about that you know hey you like the movie come read the comics you know and uh, the comics have definitely changed some of the characters to mirror more of the kind of the movie uh the movie side uh, you know the comics are definitely a good place for them to kind of experiment with storylines and ideas and some of the so you know hollywood is pulling from that so it's definitely there's a hype and there, it, it's pulling in some people um for the people that are still that are reading the stories and reading the comics because i think that there are people that are buying just for the covers and the concepts and they'll they'll buy the like 10 copies of one issue because they like the art for each one and the, you know that's one kind of collector they may or may not be reading the story inside so there's you know there might be kind of like a speculative you know things might drop down a little bit but um for the people that are reading and the people that are enjoying you know it's a great time to like i said be reading comics so i don't think there's going to be a huge bust i think some of the people that are investing right now um there's certain stuff that'll do really good over the long term there's stuff that's not so much i mean there's things that in the 90s people would put in dollar bins that people are paying 20 30 50 100 dollars for now yeah. so you know so people are kind of i'm glad that people are buying what they're excited about and I hope that it's super valuable in the future, like some of the people who bought in the 90s, and now what they have is worth a whole lot. 
So is Bloodshot just through the roof now that Vin Diesel did such an amazing <laughs> movie? <laughs> yeah, you know, people were excited about that movie beforehand. I tried to watch it. I didn't make it through all of it. I hope uh, to go back to it. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> so sorry, if there's a huge fan of like Bloodshot out there in the movie, I apologize. I'm not trying uh, to slight you, but... Oh, uh, you can just blame everything on me. <laughs> So I do see that you have some slabs right behind you. Now, oh, yeah. I've always thought they look great, I think, for display pieces. But correct me if I'm wrong. Once you slab them, you have to essentially break back into them if you want to, and that just defeats the whole purpose of slabbing them. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, if you have a book that you want to protect or if you have a book that you want to sell or get an idea about the specific value, then, yeah, it's a good idea to slab. If you want to have a book that you want to be able to read and touch and interact with, then, yeah, keep it raw. There are still some amazing comics that are in collections that are raw that have never been slabbed. But, yeah, once once it's in a slab, you basically have to crack it back out to interact with it at all. So, um, you know, you want to make sure it's something that, you know, you may, but they display very nicely. Right, they do. And do, had, have you actually sent them out, or did you buy them already slabbed? I sent out the Star Wars behind me and the Ghost Rider one behind me. Uh, the other two I acquired already slabbed. And how does that work? Is it just yeah. you just mail them out and you get them in a month, two months? Like I feel like that's a part of me that's leaving me for a very long time. <laughs> well, yeah, it can take a while. Yeah, you might be mailing off your book for a few months, especially if you're going to get it pressed and cleaned. Like That's another big thing now is... Uh, is if you have an older comic that has some defects that might be able to press out, it's literally applying, applying temperature and pressure to remove waves or dents or finger divots and cleaning. You can clean some dirt off. I mean, Elite Comics 11, we do offer pressing and cleaning. This is, it wasn't meant to be a plug, but uh, it, it's certainly something that is people are doing so they can maximize the grade that they get on the book once it's in the slab because a half a point can mean a couple hundred bucks or even a thousand dollars depending on how old the comic is and how valuable it is so eking out so there's a huge like people going back and looking at comics that were graded a long time ago and taking a look at them and seeing hey is this something i can improve is this 5.0 now a 7.0 if i get it pressed and cleaned and recreate it so you know that's a whole other aspect of the industry for sure right and I know that we're running out of time, but I do have one question. Uh, and I know if I, I'm sorry if I throw one of you guys off. Uh, is anybody excited about any current series, new series, or something that you'd want to see in the future happen? Me, I'm just excited to get my Captain America comics in. I feel bad that I left it out for so long. So I got, I literally have, I think it was, 2013 was the last time I bought. So I have over, it, I was over a hundred of Cap comics. I'm gonna sit down and work my way through. So outside of that, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right, I'm way behind. Um, it's, I have no idea what's coming out here recently, or coming out soon, or had been coming out. So right, I'm gonna tell Tor to mail me his Captain America stuff. <laughs> so Sounds good. Phil, anything that you're you're looking forward to? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what mine is. I know that Tori hates on my turtles for some reason, but the last Ronin, <laughs> the, the new one, I'm really excited about that storyline. A lot of people, I don't know if you guys know what the last Ronin is supposed to be. All the turtles are dead except for one, and we don't know who it's going to be, that last Ronin. He takes up all their, all their gear and kicks ass in the future. So that's what I'm looking forward to, and anything with Null I love. And, and the Berserker, the... Um, the Keanu Reeves uh, written book from, I think it's Boom? I don't want to say that incorrectly. It but sounds Berserker. right, but I don't remember. Yeah, what am I excited about? It? Yeah, I, I agree. Donny Cates and the, what he's writing with uh, Venom and Thor. Uh, I think the King in Black uh, uh, you know, chronic event that's coming up later this year. It looks pretty exciting. I think between Noel, uh, kind of the, the symbiote god, uh, who is seemingly a herald of some, something even bigger and more, you know, more menacing, uh, the Black Winter, who is uh, in Thor right now. Um, so just writing these big epic uh, things and also uh, pulling pulling some history. 
Yeah, the last Ronin sounds uh, like a great, right. uh, great series. I'm still trying to figure out which turtle it's going to be. So one of the turtles survives. Three of them are, are no longer with us, and we don't know which one is the survivor. I think you can kind of make an argument for each of each of them to be kind of a compelling story. Yeah, uh, most well. people want Michelangelo just because it feels like he has the best overarching arc. But I'm a Raphael fan, but he, he seems the most likely. So whatever. <laughs> Guys, that was. I could talk comic books all day. I think uh, all of us could. We might have to do a, a second episode sometime on comics again. Go back and like do a history lesson or something. But <laughs> we'll go ahead and close out comics, and then we're going to give you guys our gems of the week. Gems of the week. So I'm going to kick it off, and I'm going like out in left field. Usually I try to give you like a really good foreign movie I think you should check out or something like that, or a good podcast on your road. I stumbled across on Amazon Prime, Gary Busey, Pet Judge. Now, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's <laughs> at People's Court where Gary Busey is the judge. I've only seen two episodes because I loved it. My wife hated it. That is an understatement, and I'm, it's not allowed to play in the house when she's home. So I have to watch the rest <laughs> of it when she's not around. But I'm, I'm, I'm 99% sure that the cont not contestants, the litigators, or the the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs, yeah, the are <laughs> are uh, improv comedians, and then so it's <laughs> fake things. But I don't think they told Gary Busey because he's taking it very serious <laughs> and is very intense on judging these pet crimes. Oh so God. check out Gary Busey, pet judge. Just try one episode for me, please. That's uh, that's, that's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Figuring out which dog peed on the floor. <laughs> that's exactly it. How about you, Dad? <laughs> I've got uh, going back to Audible again. I I've been stuck in this series, oh, God, for about a year and a half now because they're so long. Um, Brandon Sanderson uh, is an author that created this uh, series called the Storm Ar uh, Stormlight Archive series. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. I'm on, I just finished book three today. Um, and he's got him on Audible. He's got him on uh, actual books. Um, but this make believe world, there's a war going on, uh, and this, where this kingdom is trying to get revenge on an assassination attempt on their king. Uh, the problem is this kingdom is done up in 10 different kingdoms. Uh, so it's really 10 different armies trying to take down one uh, set of groups. Um, uh, but the, the, the massive uh, story arc that's involved in these three books, each of these books, when I was listening to them on audio, uh, are about 40 to 50 hours long of audio content. They're a massive. Uh, they can be a little bit slow because they do have so many characters that are involved with these books. Again, I just finished book three, and it's been a year and a half. Uh, and he's supposedly going to have like 10 of these. Um, those of you who are into fantasy novels probably understand who Brandon Sanderson is. Um, but... That is my plug for the week. It's been an amazing journey. All right, how about you, Danny? All right, so what I'm going to bring you is something from James Gunn, comic book related. No, not Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> not Suicide Squad, something better. Super. So I don't know if you guys ever watched Super. Um, the reason I, I, I decided to put it on there, I was watching Umbrella Academy a few weeks ago, the, the new season. And I was like, I really don't like Ellen Page's character. So I'm like, I need to like reacquaint myself with something that I did. Like, I, and I loved Ellen Page in Super. So Super is what is it? Uh, Rain Wilson is a guy down on his luck. His wife gets stolen, captured. It doesn't matter. There, this is it. Just sets a whole thing in motion. He goes to a comic book store to really feel empowered to become a superhero. Ellen Page works in this comic book store. They become a super superhero duo uh, eventually, and they're vigilantes. The cops think he's dangerous. They tend to embrace him later on. Um, but it's a very violent little movie. Um, and it's great. It's action-packed. And hey, if you like Guardians of the Galaxy and Suicide Squad, it's nothing like it. But it's so much so awesome. <laughs> Anyways. As to it is, if I remember correctly. <laughs> now, I was gonna leave it at that, just the one gem, but I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat this time because I have to go to my favorite movie at all times. It's, it's I didn't realize it's 20 years now. Um, Brad Pitt classic i don't know why it's never actually up there with all the brad pitt movies i really don't know it's snatch i love snatch guy Ritchie film uh 
the reason I, I, I wanted to add it is because in, if I, I talk about it, for, I've been talking about it for weeks. In episode three of Umbrella Academy in season two, there is an homage to a Snatch right at the very end when they're boxing. And then just if you thought, oh, wait, that, that looks similar. They play the exact same song um, at the end. So I'm like, I love this so much more. I was already a fan of Umbrella Academy, but they, they threw in Snatch. Anyway, Snatch. What it is, it starts off, and I'm going to give you the whole rundown. Guillermo del Toro, he, he may or may not be trying to go and acquire a diamond in a nefarious way. Doesn't matter. He gets this diamond. And then a whole bunch of other cast of characters comes in. Now, a few weeks ago, I said, hey, with my other gem letter, Kenny, put on your captions. When Brad Pitt and his crew comes on, put on your captions. You will not understand what they're saying. It's my only tip there. But it has such a great cast. of uh, cast. Benicio del Toro, uh, Brad Pitt, Vinny Rain, uh, Vinny Jones, uh, Jason Statham, Lenny James from The Walking Dead. Like it has an amazing cast, and the best person, in my opinion, was Alan Ford, who plays one of the the villain, Bricktop. Great, great movie. Uh, it's a Guy Ritchie film, so you may or may not love it, but it's full of action, fun comedy, diamond heist, dogs snatching things as well. It's my favorite Guy Ritchie. Yeah, I love Snatch. That's a great one. How about you, Bill? You want to close us out for the week? All right. So I am really happy to talk about, you know, one of my favorite uh, actors of what people would call B-movies is uh, Rudger Hauer. May, he was in um, Sin City. He's been in a lot of stuff. But uh, the uh, classic Wedlock from 1991. So in this somewhat soon future there's a prison where the prisoners are uh have a, a device around their neck that if they go too far from the other prisoner that they don't know that they're kind of in wedlock with uh it'll explode and so the, what keeps me they don't need walls you don't need you know anything because if they venture too far from the prison boom so you know through a series of events he finds out that he is uh the his wedlock partner and they go off to try to recover the the stolen uh, jewels or merchandise, whatever that that uh, that he uh, and people are trying to get him. And it's just it's fun. It's it's such a uh, I love it. It's got Mimi Rogers and Rutger Hauer and Joan Chen and uh, James Remar. So uh, it's got an action. Pack, gosh, but I love it. Uh, you know, I guess while I'm stumping for Rutger Hauer. I got to mention Blood of Heroes or internationally it was known as a uh, post-apocalyptic future where this sport where um, they wear these pads and they uh, are trying to put a dog skull onto a post and it's this very violent sport and it's, you know, this pretty depressing kind of like Mad Max style future and they're get this plucky team is gaining notoriety through, uh, through winning uh, tournaments. And so they kind of raise up in the ranks. They travel from town to town. And that's how they survive. And uh, it's an awesome movie. Uh, they keep time by throwing a rocks against a metal plate. And that's literally like the timer, you know, because nothing works. There's no technology or anything else. Uh, anyways, I have a great fondness for these movies. So check them out. Check out some Rutger Hauer movies. That's my takeaway. Thanks. Well, Bill, thanks, thanks for joining us in the Dabble Den. Dan, Danny, another great one. It was great seeing you guys, talking to you guys. And then for all of you watching, I appreciate you checking us out. Make sure to like, subscribe. If you like the show, share it, follow us. You guys are great. We'll see you again next time. We're out. Yeah.